It is uh, coming up to eight minutes after two o'clock and it's time to say a very good afternoon to our Australian correspondent, Andy Raymond. Andy, good afternoon. Ah, Mr Telfer, how are you? I'm fine, I'm fit and well. You sound like a box of birds as well. (laughs) Mate, um, I'm going, well, I have to admit I'm a little concerned about our mate, uh, Mr Devlin, no, no text messages, no emails, and I'm fearing he could be locked up in a cell in Albuquerque somewhere. Uh, no, we've got a couple of updates. He was seen, believe it or not, at Niagara Falls a couple of days, <laughs> couple of days ago. He'd been up in Buffalo, which I think is upstate New York, isn't it? Watching the yeah, Buffalo yeah, Buffalo Bills play um, New South Wales or Queensland in some sort of strange game of football. But anyway, and now he's um, gone down to the Big Apple. He's actually in New York with his brother and his sons, wreaking havoc in the Big Apple. But um, um, that's... Terrific. I'm glad to hear that he was uh, he was found at Niagara Falls and he was at the top and not at the bottom, courtesy of someone <laughs> yeah, upset. Yes. yes, he probably would have um, toyed with the idea of having a little jump to see if he could survive. But uh, anyway, yeah. he's uh, in New York and we wish him well. OK, let's have a look at a bit of Aussie sport. Um, Eddie Jones, yes, is he... Is he is he coming home, as they like to say in English football? I would suggest he's coming home, but exactly what that address is, I'm not sure. Uh, there's growing speculation over here that uh, that Eddie is is going to look at um, at rugby league. Now, this is a really intriguing one. There's no coaching spots available at the moment, but if history is any gauge. Uh, by middle of May or June, there might be three or four spots available for the following year with underachieving coaches. Rugby league clubs are notoriously ruthless uh, in a results-based business and we're averaging 3.2 coaches per year sacked over the last 18 years, I think it is. Now, exactly where Eddie fits into this equation it interests me. Um, I'm curious as to if any rugby league club would take the gamble uh, as a head coach. But I think in modern sport, Brendan, the head coach is for PR. The head coach is... Yeah, he's the CEO, isn't he? He is the CEO. There, there are so many departmental heads mm. from <laughs> assistant coaches to sports science uh, to new, training methods nutrition to yeah that they they really do govern most of of the team um the coaches yeah very much the ceo he makes the final decision so i don't know if any rugby league club would be game enough to name him as a head coach but it, it isn't as absurd as what it yeah, sounds yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe a coaching director where you can tap into his theories and his philosophies, not so much on the game of rugby league, but on the mental game that every elite sportsman plays and every elite coach plays, where you're trying to get the best out of 13 or 15 individuals for an hour and a half a week. I, I think Eddie would be a real asset to a team in that respect. Well, there's a couple of uh, interesting precedents here, isn't there? I mean, I know Eddie Jones apparently had a conversation with Hamish McLennan, the boss or the chairman of the Australian Rugby over the weekend. Yep. He might do well to give, uh, probably a bloke he knows quite well, Alan Jones a ring because he, he went from coach of the Wallabies to, was it Belmain, I seem to recall, all those years ago? It certainly was. He went from coach of the Wallabies uh, a couple of years sabbatical then to the Balmain Tigers as they were before they became the West Tigers. And and look, if the truth be told, it wasn't the most successful coaching appointment in rugby league history, but it certainly wasn't the worst either. Um, Eddie and Alan, for mine, very similar type guys. They they have that habit of rubbing a lot of people the wrong way. Um they may well have a, a shelf life because their intensity and their ways are just a little bit different. But I guess uh, you could also counterbalance that and say, well, that's why they're so successful, because they are different. Mm. Uh, there's another interesting example as well. The current coach of the Irish rugby team is a guy whose name will be familiar to you, Andy Farrell, 
who was captain yes. of the Great Britain Rugby League. I can remember interviewing him on the sideline after a test match in Christchurch some years back when he was captain of the English Rugby League team. And he went to English rugby and then he went on to Irish rugby and he was in New Zealand earlier this year uh, in his head coach position on a very successful tour because they beat the All Blacks. First time the All Blacks have been beaten at home by uh, mm. Ireland or anyone from the Northern Hemisphere in a test series here. So, yes, this kind of cross-sport hybridation or, you know, mixing and amalgam- amalgamation of uh, skills coming into different sports, I think, is going to be something we're going to see a lot more of uh, in years to come. So we'll watch with interest to see where Eddie goes. OK, let's turn to some cricket matters. Um, the Windies, it's all been a bit of a yawn, hasn't it, this um, tour? I yeah. suppose they have to play each other now, don't they, under this test championship so you've got to play at least two test matches don't you is there a third one or are they, have they gone no they, they've, they've they've gone and, and thankfully they've gone um look i understand with the uh you know the, the championships and and you've got to play x amount of games and there's x amount of tours i think it's cheapening the product especially when it's lopsided both test matches were awful television they were awful spectacles uh, you want your team to win, of course, Brendan, but you don't want them just dominating from ball one to the final ball. It, look, it was boring. Thankfully, the South Africans are, have arrived and we start against them at the Gabba this Saturday. And Sandpaper Gate has absolutely <laughs> blown up again yeah. uh, over here. And it seems every second former player wants to weigh in on the debate. Uh, Michael Clark has... has you know, once again proven why he was probably the least popular public captain of Australia in recent times. He's way back in. Um, whether it's headline And, and, and what's, he, what's he had to say, Andy? What's, what's uh, Clark oh, saying? He, he said, you know, they, they, they should be giving it to, to David Warner. Um, you know, there's no friends out there. But I, 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 I think David's also... Uh, up to that, and he needs to to go back to his aggressive self and and the self that um, that uh, that didn't care, which which was essentially the self that got himself into trouble all those years ago. Um, it's been a really tough week for Dave Warner. He struggled with the bat in Perth. He withdrew his application to have that leadership ban overturned. His wife was abused uh, in Adelaide by members of the public. Um, yeah, it's tough. I and mean, Michael um, Clark's basically encouraging the South Africans to, to bring up sand, sandpaper gate. Like, they'd have their own plan. They'd have their <laughs> own theories. They may well want to just completely ignore it. But it is, it is the first time the two countries have crossed. And I guess it is a story. Mm. Uh, you know, they're, they're the facts. That's what, that's what sells papers, isn't it? Look, David Warner doesn't probably have a, a legion of fans here in New Zealand because of, you know, his sledging and uh, his general yep. behaviour. He's he's matured a, a bit, but I do support, I have, I've got a lot of support for him in this battle he's having with Australian cricket about trying to have reversed this leadership ban. I mean, this was absurd what happened. I mean, if you go to court and you're up on two charges and you're found guilty of two charges, yeah. um, you serve concurrently those penalties. Yes. You don't have six years and then another four years for a separate offence. So if Australian no. cricket wanted to put this leadership ban on him, it should have been concurrent with the 12-month ban they put on him for the ball tampering offence in the first place. But to put a lifetime ban on top of that, um, he has been very severely and uh, unfairly treated here, in my opinion. And um, uh, it doesn't seem as if the Australian cricket board is of any mind to lift that ban, is it, is it, does there? At this stage, I would have to say you're 100% right. The Australian Cricket Board, they seem immovable on this topic, which, again, is creating further debate. And, and I would suggest, you know, destabilising. It destabilises in the fact the public is sort of split. Some people still say David Warner should never be considered a leader. The word from inside the camp, and this is a really interesting one, and, and this applies for any... Uh, rugby, rugby league, cricket team, there is there is a difference between a captain and a leader and you don't need the little C next to your name to have a prominent position mm. within that group. Mm. And from within the Australian cricket group, uh, privately, 
David Warner is still a leader. Like it or not, David Warner is still a leader. He's not the captain. He's not the vice captain. He doesn't flip the coin. But in the dressing room, he is still very much a leader and they can't take that away from him. Yes, and you see that on the field, don't you? That uh, Cummins and will often yep. be having conversations with people like Smith uh, and Warner because uh, whether you like it or not, the length of time they've had playing international cricket means that they have a vast kind of vat of knowledge and experience uh, which yeah. a good captain would want to tap into. And I think uh, Absolutely. Cummins... Absolutely, and the captain on the field just can't ignore that experience. Yeah. And whether the captain's Pat Cummins or Steve Smith... You, you can't ignore that experience. And if you did, you would be absolutely crazy. Mm. So when you're out there in the heat of the battle and there's a few questions floating around the game and you look for answers, well, you look to Steve Smith and you look to David Warner, you look to guys that have been there and done it. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's a really sensitive topic still in Australian cricket, in amongst the fans... The more it gets bought up, the more destabilising it is for the players. I'm really excited for Saturday. I'm a a cricket nut. I'm a test match tragic, Brendan. And I'm really looking forward to the emotion and the challenge of Australia versus South Africa. And I, I think a lot of the world will be watching to see what the reaction is. You know, what I'm waiting for, Andy, is England and Australia in the Ashes next year a uh, baseball versus the Australian quicks. Yeah. <laughs> How about that for a, a you know a hot ticket next year? I think the Ashes series is in England, isn't it next year? Um, and yeah, the way, it is. And, and the way the England team was playing, um, how will they go? And I'm asking this question, and I'm actually going to ask a former New Zealand cricket captain, Ken Rutherford, who lives in Australia these days. I'm going to ask him that yep. in a few minutes. How will these English batsmen, the Brooks and the Crawleys and the other guys who are scoring all these runs, Johnny Best, will probably be back. How will those guys yep. go against the Australian quicks on perhaps a, a greenish track at Lords or somewhere? I think you're better, best off asking Ken and not me. I was the worst, worst under-16 grade five cricketer you've ever seen. Um, I love the theory in sport, whether it's boxing, league or cricket, that attack is often the best form of defence. And what Brendan is doing with the Poms, I think is terrific. And I think it has the real potential to reinvigorate the game and and have more fans returning to test match cricket. I think it's terrific. Um, I was a, a huge fan of, of Baz as a cricketer in, in any form. I was a huge fan of his mindset. I've been lucky enough to do a couple of longer form interviews with him over the years thoroughly impressed with his mindset, his theories, his determination. He's a, he's a dogged little bulldog, and what he's doing is, um, I think, terrific, mate. I, I really, really do. Yeah, I, most of us agree with that. My only reservation, and, and maybe I'm just being a bit sensitive here, is that I don't know whether we want the three forms of cricket, T20, yep. 50 over, and Test match, all governed by this idea of go out there and smash the ball as hard as you can. Uh, I think Test cricket, oddly enough, uh, has a uniqueness because of it's a five-day event. It has its own yep. pace. It has its own rhythm. Uh, it has its own particular strategies and tactics, which you don't and can't apply in other forms of the game. But if it's all 500 runs a day in Test cricket, it's sort of kind of like T20 on roller skates, isn't it? Whether it's test match or 50 overs. So uh, I, I kind of like the variety of cricket that you get across the three forms of the game, rather like you do in, uh, I suppose, uh, rugby or rugby league when you have 13s yep. and 15s and then 7s and 10s. Um, but anyway, I'm going to discuss this with Ken Rutherford in a moment. Anyway, Andy, we'd better leave it there. I thank you very much indeed. We'll talk to you again uh, for the last time uh, this year, I think, uh, next uh, Wednesday. Have a good week. Look forward. Look forward to it, Brendan. Have a great week. And everyone listening, have a fabulous one.